I'm Sean. Okay. <laughs> and I am the BCO Youth Representative for Shropshire, and I'll be your host for tonight. And we are really excited that you have joined us this evening for a talk from Zoe Cullen, um, Fauna and Flora's International's Director of Climate and Nature Linkages. In this session, Zoe will talk about her career to date and answer your questions about the climate and biodiversity crisis and how her work aims to tackle them. And so without further ado, I will um, hand over to Zoe and we can begin. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you all. It's quite a star-studded lineup for the Nature Natters, so um, I'm not uh, under any illusion that it's a privilege to be invited. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I've got a few slides um, just to uh, aid the, the initial presentation. I will attempt to share my screen. Um, give me just one moment. Where's it gone? Uh, here we go. Um, it gone? Uh, for some reason, I'm having an issue, but I will resolve it in a moment. Sorry, just give me a minute and I will work this out. Just need to find the right tab. Everything okay, Zoe? It has. <laughs> it should be fine. It well, was just, fine just a moment ago. It's okay. While well, we're just waiting, does anyone want to leave any good birds they've seen recently in the chat? Let me start a little conversation, see what everyone's seen recently. Oh, very nice. Peregrine from Faye. Excellent. Oh. Siskin, lovely, red-breasted goose. Oh, really good birds. Spoonbill, oh, that is nice. I'd love to see a spoonbill again, I can't wait. Hopefully soon, or at least this year. Goose sand on your webs count, that is good. Oh, so lucky. Oh, on my webs, you usually only get most exciting bird is a little grebe. Ah, and it's up and running. Okay, Zoe, I'll hand back over to you now. Thank you, Sean. That was fantastic feeling. Yeah. <laughs> that was really nice. Um, so brilliant. Um, so, um, yeah, my name's Zoe Kiros Cullen. Um, I am the Director of Climate and Nature Linkages at Fauna and Flora International, which is an international conservation NGO, which I'm sure um, some of you will have heard of. Um, We're an organisation operating um, with projects in about 40 countries worldwide, um, focusing on the conservation of biodiversity threatened species and habitats, um, but with a wide range of approaches to doing that and with an increasingly strong focus on how our work intersects with tackling the climate crisis. Um, hence the focus of, um, of my role and, and the programme that I'm running within FFI. So I'm going to kick you off um, just with um, a few slides about my early, uh, early years, my education and, and what led me into a career in conservation. Um, and then just a little bit about um, the nature of some of the work that we're working on in FFI on climate and nature. Um, and I will try to keep the talking to a minimum um, so that we can um, also have plenty of time for, for conversation and, and, and questions. So just sort of kicking things off, I think I'm probably like um, like like many in this group. Um, much of, of what inspired me early on was just a natural affiliation with nature. Um, this is me with my younger sister and um, with my very first pet rabbit. Um, these are I was, I was trying to reflect on on where my moments of inspiration came from. And I think um, there are just a few things that stand out and. I think early direct interaction with wildlife and also with um, with domestic pets um, really 
built on an innate love of, of nature. And, and I think that will be very familiar to most of you in this group, um, but was really um, supported, enhanced, I guess, by certain experiences in my, in my early life and by certain people in my early life as well. Um, one of the sort of standout experiences that really um, sticks out in my mind and I can definitely identify as being quite a pivotal moment in my in my youth was um, when I was about 11 years old had the opportunity to travel to Chitwan National Park in Nepal. Um, Nepal was a country where my father was working at the time um, and uh, we went out to visit him. Uh, Chitwan is an unbelievable place um, uh, conservation area for for Indian one horned rhino for for the Bengal tiger for many 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 species. Um, I think it was the first time that I knowingly met a conservationist. Um, you can possibly tell um, from the picture as I sort of gaze admiringly at her that I was much more focused on the individual than the experience and she left really quite a strong impression this person whose name I can't remember but was was working um, herself um, in Chitwan and um, I guess was one of the first moments that I realized that such such roles and, and such types of career existed. Um, at the same time I think uh, the experience in Nepal was a pretty pivotal one for me in terms of my understanding of the world in general. Um, I saw some incredible wildlife. Um, we we're incredibly fortunate enough to see tiger in the wild, which not everyone does um, when they when they visit. Um, but I was also exposed to the the the, the haves and the haves nots in in a sense. You know what it's like to live with a lot less um, and how fortunate <clears throat> my, my position uh, or my, my background was in the, in the sense of access to education and, um, and all the sort of benefits that I had just by dint of, of where I was born and, and, and my family background. Um, this family um, in this picture here, we're living in a, in a small house um, in someone else's garden and they lived six people in a in a in a tiny dwelling looking after that garden and they were incredibly wonderful people um very welcoming and and all of that but it it, it struck me and and left a I guess a big impression on me at an early stage when I hadn't really exposed been sort of experienced um differences in 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 wealth and and well-being across the world um <laughs> This is a, a funny picture, but um, it's my first pet corn snake. Again, sort of uh, connection with with my own uh, experiences with with animals. But a lot of it was inspired actually by one of the sort of early mentors in my life, who's actually a, a relation, a second cousin, um, a guy called Richard Gibson, who who now um, is director of conservation at Auckland Zoo. Um, but when I sort of remember him as a sort of a teenager obsessed with um, boa constrictors and when he went to university he tried to convince my mum that I should take on his snakes and that was flatly refused but the impression remained and he went on to work at, at Jersey Zoo and and then at um, Zoological Society of London and has always had a very strong focus on on the importance of high quality in situ conservation and the protection um, and support of, of threatened species through that mechanism. Um, I think zoos are not always um, well understood in terms of the role that they can play in not only in supporting uh, international conservation, but also in terms of, of, of the role they play in raising awareness. Um, and, and a sense of connection with nature. Um, of course, there are bad zoos, but there are also exceptional ones. And, and certainly Richard and, and his career has been a source of inspiration to me. Um, I then sort of having done A-levels in geography, biology and Italian, which was quite an unusual mixture, but I very much enjoyed. Um, I went to Bristol University to study zoology. Um, I was at that time very much focused on, on, on species and animal behavior. And I, I think I thought I was gonna go into a career in, in some form of academia and I was going to, 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 to 
develop a, a career around the study of animal behavior. Um, it was my first experience, I suppose, during that time of really understanding and um, and meeting proper birders. I, I can't claim to be a birder. I would love to be better at um, bird identification, certainly by song, um, because that's definitely not one of my strengths. But I did spend time at the Chew Valley Ringing Station with that group and, and learned about bird ringing and, and developed a much greater um, love for birds through that experience. Experience um, and 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 certainly Bristol was um, was a great place to be. <clears throat> um, a fantastic zoology department, but also a really um, great part of the world with many um, interesting places to to visit. Um, after that, um, I think my my background in sort of my earlier experiences of travel. Um, and then my growing interest in, in conservation courses in restoration ecology, for example, while I was at Bristol, um, I was starting to think more and more about um, how the future of, of, of species and the future of, of their habitats is, is absolutely not in isolation of, of what's going on in the rest of the world, um, how it interacts with um, with with business and and global economies, um, how it interacts with human well being, um, and so I was really wanting to take my education in a direction that would enable me to explore those issues and to try to um, engage with conservation in a way that I could understand the drivers of things that were causing loss of biodiversity and loss of habitats around the world. Um, so that took me to the London School of Economics and Political Science, where I did. Um, a master's degree uh, in environmental policy, planning and regulation. Um, that was a one year degree, which really introduced me to some very sort of pivotal concepts, um, which are sort of foundational in our, our sector, I suppose, um, and, and, and have, have been immensely valuable to me in terms of how I've brought my more scientific background um, into more of the, well, my more natural sciences background into a more sort of social sciences context. Um, so understanding what sustainable development means, um, what the principles are of how economies um, function and how environmental economics um, plays, plays out, um, looking at issues around how business operates um, and particularly what it means to be a responsible business. Um, I think the term corporate social responsibility can seem a little outdated now. I think things have moved on, but at the time when I was doing my master's, it was very much sort of the cutting edge in terms of um, what businesses were doing to think in a more responsible way about the environment and about their impacts on, on, on society in general. Um, it was also an opportunity to learn much more about, about government um, and, and the world of policy. Um, and how sort of international and national policies um, with respect to the environment um, are, are so key. So um, having completed my master's, I, I, I was fortunate enough to um, connect with uh, the director of business and biodiversity at Fauna and Flora at that time. So her remit was, was very much around how um, we, as an organization and as a conservation movement um, can engage with and influence and support change um, within businesses um, and look at how to um, meaningfully move, help them to move onto a pathway of reducing their impacts on, on, on nature and people and, and indeed try to move to more of a trajectory of positive impact. Um, so, those are my sort of initial movement into to FFI, and FFI is, is an interesting organization. It has um, uh, always been fairly much on the front foot in terms of its, its views around working with, with business. Um, it uh, was one of the earlier uh, NGOs to take a very pragmatic sort of partnership approach to working with the sector always trying to do so um, very carefully and very selectively, genuinely looking to work with businesses that are serious about change and, and improvement. 
And I think that's one of the things that really inspired me about the organization at the outset. Um, I haven't stayed with a, with a pure focus on, in, on, on sort of working with business um, throughout my career, um, but I've always been inspired by FFI's approach um, to partnership. Um, it's willingness to, to sort of uh, work in some complex um, contexts, um, not, not shying away from, from, from complicated issues and trying to be um, a solution provider in terms of offering partnership where there is um, serious willingness to, to work together. Um, so uh, there you can just see a, a couple of, of pictures of me in, in, in the early days. Um, one of the sort of first uh, roles that I, I took on with FFI after my um, sort of initial sort of quite short-term project was um, to take on management of something called the Rapid Response Facility, um, which is a small grant scheme for World Heritage Sites. Um, World Heritage Sites are some of the most exceptional sites for nature um, or for culture around the world. Um, and uh, the funding mechanism was set up to be the most rapid funding mechanism in the world. So essentially making small grants available to respond to crisis situations. Um, the grant applications are turned around um, in, in eight working days, which is, makes it one of the fastest funders that's out there um, and means that when there's a crisis situation, such as a, um, a serious uncontrolled uh, fire, forest fire, for example, um, or um, there's been damage to um, some kind of conservation infrastructure, um, the fund is able to move in very quickly. This was pretty incredible thing for me to get landed with um, at an early stage in my career, because as you can see from this map, um, the rapid response facility has had an impact in a lot of countries around the world. Um, it's uh, supported um, a number of World Heritage Sites in crisis, um, 30 plus um, since it was launched. Um, and in those days, I was um, lucky to be able to make some visits to some of the sites and really understand um, a bit more about the conservation challenges that were being faced in those places. Um, so one of the first places I went to was um, Guatemala. Um, and to the um, Sierra de la Candon Reserve, which is on the border with um, between Guatemala and Mexico. Um, you can see here um, that this is the Rio Sumashinta. Um, it is a river which is also the functional border between those two countries. Um, and in that context, um, the grant funding was really to um, support the local organization that was responsible for um, uh, helping to manage and protect the national park on the Guatemala side um, to deal with um, serious issues of um, uh, loss of forest in those places, which was driven by sort of illegal activity moving across the border um, between the two countries. Um, so there you could see sort of the, the geopolitics um, coming into play and some really quite challenging contexts that the, the local partners in Guatemala were working in, um, security threats um, and, and the challenges of working in that environment where it's most definitely um, the, the social and political dynamics um, that were driving the pressure on the forest. Another place um, that I went to that has become very important to me and, and ended up becoming a sort of significant part of my career for a number of years um, was Kerinci Sablat uh, National Park in Indonesia. Um, they received um, a rapid response facility grant um, because of um, proposed road construction going through the park, which would have fragmented it significantly. Um, it's one of the last strongholds of the critically endangered Sumatran tiger um, and uh, a very important place to retain, remain intact. Um, when I went there, the funds were going to um, a group of local organizations, um, small NGOs that were 
um, working together very actively um, to try and find um, constructive alternatives to road construction. Um, so really a grassroots movement to, to protect the national park um, and engage local people in that process. Um, what I found there was, was left, left a, a huge impression on me. You know, there was significant forest clearance um, and it was very clear that there were, there were a lot of drivers. There was, there was the key question around access and the desire for roads to, to, to be able to move around that landscape more easily. And um, there was demand for, for, for timber, for conversion of the land to coffee, to rubber, to oil palm. Um, and there was there was basics of subsistence living, um, very very low incomes and, and people really surviving on the margins. Um, so in that context, um, and also with the issues of sort of also conflict between tigers and people, with the more the forest was cleared, the more contact there was between people and and these incredible animals. Um, you're really trying to unpack a quite complex um, situation and find ways um, in which people can coexist more peacefully and more productively um, and, and also further their own development interests in a way that, that, that biodiversity can also be conserved. Um, so we spent a lot of time um, thinking about how to engage um, as an organization um, more proactively with the communities around the park. And I ended up um, relocating to Indonesia for a few years while we expanded what was a tiger focused program into a tiger focused program that also had a big um, uh, program of engagement with communities living um, in the buffer zone around the national park. Um, and through the incredible teamwork of, of the local partners both within government and within civil society um, we spent um, and the program continues working with communities to help them to secure greater security over the forest areas that they they live within um, the rights to to retain access to them and to manage them sustainably with support for their sustainable livelihoods um, and and support to manage those areas. Um, so <clears throat> with a real sort of people, nature, forest angle and, and bringing those different threads together in a way that it, it, it aligns everyone's interests um, in favor of conservation, um, we've been able to develop a program that's expanded quite substantially. Um, so can't lay any claim to this because it's been taken forward by an amazing team in country, but now working with um, upwards of 83 villages, quite a substantial forest area um, and engaging large numbers of, of women and men in the process of, of community-based forest management around the more formal um, national park. Um, and, in doing that, um, supporting community-based patrols or management of those forest areas, um, um, restoration of, of some of the degraded parts of the forest and significant work around um, livelihoods development. So I guess one of the things that was really coming through for me um, in my career at this point was fine, you know, we can work with people on helping them to gain greater recognition of their rights over natural resources. Um, we can um, look at um, ways of supporting sustainable livelihoods, but again, to get really significant long-term support for conservation, there needs to be a long-term incentive. Um, people on very low income need to be able, um, or any people in general needs to have, uh, have a good, um, reason to want to use the forest in one way rather than clearing it and using the land for another purpose. Um, so we started to look at other mechanisms that could create that longer term incentive. Um, and the, the concept of payment of e for ecosystem services um, is, is quite a well-known one in conservation um, where there is a, a link between um, good practice in terms of sustainable management of, of, of ecosystems being rewarded through some kind of payment mechanism. 
Um, and this is where it really starts to move into a focus on, on climate. Um, I, I took a bit of time out. Um, I went to the um, Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge to study a master's in business, um, which was a very valuable way of, of developing greater skills around how, um, not only how, how business works, but also um, how to think about um, financing the conservation movement and, and the work of NGOs in a more sustainable way and how to connect the partners that we work with, with more sustainable sources of income. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we have in the NGO sector is, is, our, um, is our very heavy reliance on, on grant funding, which is absolutely pivotal for all that we do. Um, you know, we need funders um, to enable us to work, but there are ways in which we can build on um, sort of more traditional funding mechanisms to develop more entrepreneurial ways of operating and accessing sources of funding that can be more sustainable in the long term, whether that's supporting the development of businesses at, um, at community level that are aligned with, with sustainable practice, um, or whether that's also um, linking with other sources of finance, um, which are emerging, for example, as the climate and nature movements come together and there's recognition of the role of ecosystems in, in responding to the climate crisis. Um, and there becomes um, uh, routes by which funding to tackle the climate crisis can, can come in and, and support um, the work of, of nature and people that are protecting nature. Um, so in recent years, the, the concept of nature-based solutions um, has um, gained a lot of traction um, globally. Um, essentially, it's, and this is, I should say, a diagram which is credited to the, uh, um, uh, to the IUCN, um, but is um, essentially using ecosystem-based approaches or using nature um, to, to underpin our response to addressing a whole range of societal challenges, whether that's climate change, whether that's poverty or food insecurity, whether that's issues around water quality, whatever it is, there are ecosystem-based ways um, which through investing in nature and supporting the protection and restoration of nature, we can drive outcomes that are positive um, for human well-being and for biodiversity. Um, one thing that we've we've seen um, in in recent years has been um, particularly in the lead up to the to the UN conference on climate change um, last year is a real coming together of our understanding around the connections between nature and climate, um, and that's one of the reasons why FFI recently established a dedicated climate and nature linkages program, and and um, I've been. Um, delighted to be part of the, the development of that. Um, so in sort of terms of articulating that connection between, between nature conservation and, and climate, um, and why the, the issues of biodiversity loss are very much connected with the climate crisis, um, is that ecosystems store enormous amounts of carbon. Different ecosystems store different amounts. Um, but you know, tropical forests like this one here in, in Cambodia um, or um, coastal systems, particularly mangroves, for example, um, which occur in, in, in the Pekka Channel in Tanzania, um, store vast amounts of, of natural carbon. And protecting these places and ensuring that um, they're not cleared and the carbon that they store is not released into the atmosphere is playing a very critical role um, in, in, in making sure that we don't lose more carbon into the atmosphere. Equally, restoring places that have been degraded is playing a critical role in drawing carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so FFI did an assessment of the um, carbon storage just in its um, terrestrial projects last year. And there's, there's um, more than 1 billion tons of um, 
uh, carbon stored just in those sites. So we know the value of conservation is 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 as is of um, equal value, or I mean, equivalence is a strange word, but um, it's the 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 value for biodiversity is also matched by its value for climate. And I think this is really elevating the understanding of those sectors that maybe have been less engaged with biodiversity before around why why nature is so important. Um, so um, FFI is working in a range of, of sites. I'm going to speed up a little bit, but um, this is an example of some of our work in Northwest Liberia. Um, this map here shows a um, sort of a, it shows the risk of deforestation in these key areas over the next 10 years. What FFI is doing here is working to um, bring um, key areas um, of the Upper Ghanaian forest area under more sustainable management and then work with um, local communities and with governments to basically quantify how much climate value and how much biodiversity and community value has been created out of this work. Um, and, and in doing so, um, aim to connect these communities with um, a market for the carbon which exists. Um, you may have, um, heard of the, the concept of reducing emissions for, from deforestation or forest degradation or red plus. And it's a mechanism by which um, high forest and, and low or sort of developing countries can access payments for protecting their forests. Um, and that has to be off the back of having proved that deforestation rates have reduced. But it is a way in which um, these nations can be meaningfully um, the, the, the critical global benefit that is being provided by retaining these forests can actually be acknowledged and rewarded, um, or not rewarded, actually just paid for because, because um, they're, they're providing a service to the planet. Um, so um, linked to this and linked to sort of the coming together of the climate and nature agendas, you may also have heard of the concept of carbon credits, um, the voluntary carbon market, um, carbon offsets. Um, they've had a, um, the, and it, it is this concept of, of um, emissions um, being produced in one place being offset by um, uh, by um, emissions being avoided or, or or taken out of the atmosphere in another place or in another way. Um, and increasingly a market is created where, um, for example, um, um, companies in, in some contexts are working out how to reduce their carbon emissions, but they're also finding that there are emissions they can't yet eliminate, um, and they are um, using nature-based offsets to, to essentially balance this out. Um, I would love to talk a bit more about the detail of that. I'm sure you have questions. There are reasons for this to be an opportunity for nature, and there are reasons also for this to be a risk for nature, and I'm very happy to, to go into that in a bit more detail in the, in the questions, if that's useful. Um, just to say, an increasing part of our work is, is not always at site level. Um, whilst we're trying to work with, with our partners um, and with communities on the ground to try and make sure that the enormous value of the work they're doing to protect nature um, and, and and also uh, in service of the climate is recognized and connected with, with more sustainable sources of funds that support this work. And we're also trying to make sure that the whole um, demand for nature-based carbon and the way at which it is used um, is, is, is developing in a, in a way that will continue to deliver greater ambition for tackling climate change and will not be used in any way to sort of dilute effort or distract uh, attention away from decarbonization. We can't put that on nature. Nature needs to be part of the solution, but, but, but in terms of the climate crisis, it's fundamentally got to be about reducing emissions in the first place. 
Um, so a lot of what we're doing now is, is looking at ways in which we can influence that agenda, whether that's through governments, whether that's through um, our private sector partners to say, look, let's do this. Let's make sure that, um, you know, now that the, the connection between climate and nature is being seen, but at this point, we don't feel it's yet being fully understood. It's recognized, but it's not necessarily um, being um, universally dealt with um, in, in the right way. So we're, we're now really focused also on how to ensure that this whole movement moves ahead um, with quality. And the qualities that are key are particularly focused on how it's delivered on the ground. Um, it's got to be about local people. Um, it's got to be about local leadership um, and it's got to be about um, ensuring that biodiversity continues to be a key part of the focus and it's not carbon exclusively, which is it's another thing that we're, we're seeing quite um, carbon centric view of the world, um, which is very necessary because the climate crisis is so urgent. Um, but let's make sure that in the interests of climate, we're not planting lots of monoculture plantations which have no value for for birds or other aspects of biodiversity so as much as it's about what needs to be done it's also very much about the how just a final point around adaptation as well um, we talk a lot about tackling climate change um, in terms of the role of nature in 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 reducing emissions or or um, storing carbon um, but it's also about adaptation people and wildlife can't adapt to climate change unless we're taking holistic um, views and ensuring that the sort of intact ecosystems are prioritized because they are the most resilient um, and they will best protect people um, from, from the, the, the sort of the impacts of climate change that, that, we'll, that we're already seeing occur. Um, so this is a just a a few pictures of some work in, in Nicaragua, um, which is really integrating um, uh, climate smart agriculture approaches, which, which build resilience in the local agricultural economy for local people, um, but is also ensuring the protection of key habitat for the um, yellow-naped parakeet, which is one of the key um, threatened species um, on Ometepe Island in Nicaragua. Um, and just a, a quick mention of the of the climate importance of of marine and coastal systems. Um, Sophie Bembo um, will be doing a nature natter in a in a in a couple of months' time. Uh, she's the marine head at FFI, and will be able to speak much more fully to the role of of um, marine and coastal systems in the context of climate change as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Zoe. I think we can all agree that was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure that a lot of us here tonight will resonate with both you and Flora and Fauna International's ethos. It was absolutely amazing to hear. It is now time for the Q&A. If anyone would like the opportunity to say their question out loud, please raise your hand and I will address it. Otherwise, I will just read out any questions from the chat. Um, any ones you have, just drop them in and I will read them out for Zoe to answer. Um, so we've got a question here, which says, do you feel hopeful about the future of the planet? That's a great question. Um, I do. I'm an absolute optimist, um, but I'm also a great believer in the resilience of nature. Um, and I'm a great believer in, um, in the commitment that I am seeing in the world around climate and nature. To be honest, it's quite a daunting time to work in the sector. I, I'm not gonna lie, I think, um, and I'm sure this is resonates amongst many young people. You know, I think um, there is, um, there's a lot in the press. Um, we, can, we can see um, impacts of climate change being felt around the world, but one thing that I think is incredible, and I certainly felt it when I was in Glasgow at COP, um, and I, I feel it increasingly is that more and more sectors are getting very, very focused on this issue. Um, not all of it are completely doing it in the way that we would want, but by and large, there's just, there's a gear shift in terms of, of energy. And um, I believe that with enough 
um, people who really understand the issues supporting that process and doing what they can to enable it and steer it in a positive direction, um, that there is a lot of progress that can be made. Um, that said, I do find it really important to take moments to just sit back and focus on nature. I spend a lot of time at my desk, at my laptop, or, um, or speaking to people. I don't spend a lot of time in nature, and I do need that in order to sort of revive that positivity. So I think the fact that you started the session talking about bird sightings is exactly uh, the antidote to some of the anxiety. <laughs> Okay, so I've got another question for you here, and it says, do you use sustainable buildings to help nature? Hmm. Really interesting question. Um, so I wouldn't say that we are, as an organisation, particularly expert on sustainable buildings. We certainly um, understand their importance. Um, we sit here um, in a building called the David Attenborough Building um, in Cambridge, which hosts a cluster of conservation organisations. Um, and all of the organisations involved have been very keenly focused on how to make the building as sustainable as possible, um, because that is obviously in line with the ethos of, of those of us that occupy it. Um, but in our projects um, on the ground, I don't think we do that much construction, so it's probably not so relevant, but it's a fascinating area and really important. Oh, lovely to hear. And we've got another question for you. What are some of the most exciting species that you've got to work with? Oh, um, well, Tigers 100% because um, I, I mean, I didn't give enough um, credit to this incredible lady that appeared in one of my slides, but um, this is this is Deborah Marta, Debbie Marta, um, who established the Sumatran Tiger um, Conservation Programme of FFI um, in Karinchi back in 2000, um, pretty much on a shoestring. And it's an unbelievable programme that's run in partnership with the National Park. Um, and it really has um, been responsible for maintaining um, the, the, the health of this really key remaining population of Sumatran tiger. Um, so I, I would count that. I think it was when I visited her and she, was, um, she had a rescued Malay sun bear. She had a, unfortunately a rescued baby clouded leopard, um, which, which unfortunately didn't didn't survive, but she, yeah, the the madness of that first experience was got, what got me back to Indonesia for three solid years after that. And um, she's an incredible human being. Yeah, yeah, it sounds, and it's such a beautiful photo of the tiger, by the way, what a truly beautiful species. Um, so I've got another question for you, and it is, what is your favorite thing about working for an international organization like the FFI? Um, so earlier in my career, I would have put travel up there quite high um, because it was um, I was very fortunate to be able to get quite a bit of um, exposure to different places. Um, and it was I didn't necessarily start at the organization thinking I wanted to spend time working overseas, but it became apparent to me. Um, a few years in that it would be very valuable and the opportunity to be able to live and work um, in another culture, um, learn a completely new language, try and use that in a professional context um, and work with the conservation issues playing out in front of me day in day out where you'd have a, a head of a local village dropping into your office at, at any time of day. Um, that felt immediate and it felt very local and I, I sort of miss that a bit now and makes me think I want to engage much more with sort of UK based conservation um, in some way because it's nice having things that are on your doorstep. Um, but but with FFI I think it's it's also hands down about the people um, being in a sort of global role now I'm able to interact with with um, partners and staff that are based in many different places and, and you learn a lot. And do you think that sort of expansive or expanding worldview is useful in a complicated world where we're, we need to sort of manage a lot of different issues? Um, I was saying earlier, we've got a new colleague who's just relocated his family from Bhutan. I mean, for me, that's 
um, mind blowing and to have the opportunity to work with, with people like that is great. And I've got another question for you here. What does a typical day in your job involve? And do you still get to do any field work? <laughs> um, I do less field work now, but that's partly personal choice because I have young family. So travel is, is not quite as convenient at this point. But um, uh, I, I do... I do still um, travel sometimes, but I uh, I also tend to spend a lot of time, you know, working working remotely. Uh, it could be a call on Belize one hour, Liberia the next, then Cambodia. Then it's something much more management focused and working out how to sort of support members of my team um, in their work um, or um, deal with a. Uh, or engage with a, one of the many organizations that we work with, trying to sort of be more influential on organizations. So we might be working um, or speaking to a large multinational company and talking about how they plan to invest in nature and climate. And are they thinking about the right things? Um, you know, do we have advice for them on, on what, they, what they should be thinking about? So um, it's quite varied. It definitely sounds like one of those uh, no no day is the same type of jobs. Yes, I think that's fair. <laughs> Another question. Do you work with any other conservation organisations, e.g. the Wildlife Trust in the UK? Ah, OK, good. So we do. We don't have a very um, large UK presence. We've always been sort of pr primarily focused on, on developing countries. But that said, we have an expanding... Um, marine program in Scotland so we do quite a lot of work with communities on community managed um, marine protected areas in in, in the Scottish context. Um, we do huge amounts of work with um, other conservation organisations um, internationally so one of the things I really like um, most about FFI is the fact that we are very focused on partnership and we're very focused on um, enabling rather than leading. So um, we like to structure our conservation work so that it's empowering local local partners to do as much of the work as possible. We provide technical support. We collaborate on fundraising. Um, in some countries, we have physical teams that are working with local partner organizations. In other countries, we simply support a local partner. Places like Turkey, Belize, for example, um, there are very few FFI staff on the ground because you know we're, we're just supporting and working with amazing organizations. Okay, I've got another one here. So this one's from Arjun, who is studying nature-based solutions as a topic at university. And he um, asks, do you think it's something that should or could be added to the curriculum for younger ages going forward? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think... Um, <clears throat> I, I think... I think there's a lot that, that there, are, there are sort of many things that could be but I feel you know dif different aspects of, of how we of how we respond to the climate crisis the role of nature within that and the role of nature in addressing all societal challenges you know the there is a there is a large um you know many of you will have heard of the sustainable development goals of the UN um, they address many questions around um around um health um poverty, um, education, um, you know, a lot of societal issues as well as environmental ones. And I think um, nature has a, has a very important part in all of this. You know, the pandemic has highlighted issues around the connection between nature and health that need to be better understood and better managed. Um, so I think uh, climate change wasn't really on in my school education. Um, I can't see a rationale and I, I, I'm assuming that's changed significantly by now. I certainly hope it has, but I think nature-based solutions need to be a key part of it. Um, and I also think it, it, it also, in addition to school education, it's also around um, some of the training for people who are going to other sectors. So one of the biggest changes we're seeing now um, is that because 
nature and climate and the role of nature in responding to the climate crisis is 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 so um, is so better understood that that the, that um, skills in this area are being recruited in industry, in banks, um, in 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 consulting firms, in all sectors, in government. There's actually a real shortage of people who really understand ecosystems and how nature-based solutions, for example, would be developed and implemented well in practice. You know, the social sciences, the ecological sciences, how they come together and connect in these sectors. So there is, there is a skills crisis now as well, and, and there is gonna be no shortage of need and opportunity for people wanting to work in a wide range of different sectors on this kind of um, area. Thank you for that. And another question here, um, going back to what you were saying earlier, what is your personal opinion of carbon offsetting and do you think it works in practice? Um, thanks, I was hoping this question would come up. Um, my personal view is um, that it can be a very effective way of getting sustainable finance into places for their long-term protection. Um, that if you can connect um, a high carbon landscape such as a tropical forest or a mangrove ecosystem or even other ecosystems, um, increasingly grasslands and, and other ecosystems are being brought into that kind of mechanism. Um, I think personally, I think it's critical that there are ways for climate finance to flow into those places because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for those places to be maintained. That said, it's all about the how. And we do see examples of where offsets are used, being used without integrity um, in ways, you know, by actors that aren't prioritizing decarbonization first. Um, and also um, there are there are some there are some projects out there that don't have great credentials. They might be delivering climate benefits. Um, but they're not necessarily thinking about people or biodiversity. Um, and badly developed projects are a major risk um, and could be very, um, you know, they could, they could certainly um, marginalize people who are already very marginalized um, and, and be exploitative. Um, and they could also um, have negative impacts on biodiversity. So for us, it's, it's, it's I think, as I was mentioning um, in the presentation, a lot of our focus now is on the how. We think that they can be done very well and that they can have a really, really important role to play in accelerating the route to, to sort of a net zero economy. Um, but it's it, the, the devil is in the detail and we've got to make sure that there's real scrutiny on how the, these offsets are being used. Um, I think there is more scrutiny now. You certainly see plenty in the media. Um, so we want to see um, companies being held to account for what they're doing on decarbonization and what types of um, projects they're investing in. Just realized I'm muted. Um, so I am, I am now speaking again. For a, um, a final question, do you have any exciting plans or projects for the future? Um, <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're really, um, working on um expanding expanding what we so we you know we work in 40 plus countries around the world so we've got you know a pretty large project portfolio um our our focus is really um within the climate and nature linkages program is focused on supporting more of those places to benefits and access um international climate finance there is a lot of finance out there. What we want to do is make sure it's getting to the right places, that it's getting to more of the critical habitats, that it's prioritizing protection of places so that we can avoid more loss of biodiversity that we can't afford, and that we're supporting um, more local people to, to, to get um, access to the benefits they deserve for protecting those places. So um, for us, it's all about scaling up how we connect our existing um, project areas and our partners and the communities that we work with, um, with, with long-term support 
um, and also how we how we really um, build in um, and sort of ecosystem based approaches to adaptation um, as well as um, mitigation of climate change. That's a bit of a general answer, but it's, it's essentially just about how we do more of what we're already doing. <laughs> well, I thought it was a very good summary. And I, I'm sure that everyone here tonight will join me in giving you a massive thank you for coming to talk to us tonight. It was absolutely fascinating. And um, if anyone has any more questions, I'm sure that if you leave them in the chat, we can ask Zoe and email those out to you. Um, so I'd say if we're just starting to wrap it up, we'll just put on Zoe and Fauna and Flora, Flora, oh, Fauna and Flora Initiative's social media that you can go and follow. And we'll have a few notices after that before we all leave. So I just want to remind you all of the upcoming Birding 101 on citizen science with Mark. It will be sure to be absolutely amazing. And I would recommend all of you go and sign up if you haven't already. Then we should also have um, another Nature Nut is coming up. Hopefully you enjoyed this one enough to come along to the next. It is with Tony Juniper, the head of Natural England, and that's on the 9th of March. And as Zoe mentioned in her presentation, we also have another Nature Nationals, another member of the FFI, Sophie Bembo, and that is on the 6th of April. So it's definitely a date you should all put in your diaries. Um, I just want to give everyone a massive thank you again for coming, before mentioning the equipment donation scheme. Um, so this is a scheme run by the BTO. If you don't know it already, it's definitely something worth looking into, and it's definitely something we're looking to promote at the moment. And to contact us more, you can either follow the link or send us an email. We'll be sure to answer any questions you might have about the BTO or our youth work. And uh, once again, a big thank you to Zoe and a big thank you for all of you for attending. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, and lovely to meet everyone virtually. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.